uh, who came for the robots today? Everybody. Everyone. Uh, who came for the humans? <laughs> okay, uh, what's up? Uh, Diane, we go general purpose robots. Uh, more specifically, we leverage uh, the existing foundation models and uh, end, end models to deploy uh, production in production environments. Uh, most uh, Our clients are mostly in the hospitality space, uh, longer mass hotels, uh, hospitals, uh, also in the manufacturing 3PL uh, space as well. Uh, and uh, since we founded last year, we raised about 120, uh, 140 plus uh, million dollars. Uh, and we're one of the uh, frontier labs uh, in uh, in end -end ro uh, robot research. Perfect. Maybe a uh, quick intro from my side as well. So I spent a good decade in the automotive industry uh, doing corp dev and CVC work, mainly looking at manufacturing technologies, robotics. Uh, one of the last investments we did was uh, agility robotics, so one of the humanoid companies. Uh, after that, we went into cybersecurity for a good year, right now with HPE working on the AI infrastructure layer. So anything with GPUs and compute uh, on prem, off prem, on the edge. Um, and as such, also working a lot with robotics companies and physical AI startups. Um, and with that being said, so you, you already gave a good segue into, into this chat. So you work with host, uh, hospitality companies and some use cases that are not that covered yet with, with other robotic solutions. Everyone's like going for like manufacturing environments and the typical stuff in the automotive industry. So what, what excites you about those application areas and, and what are specific challenges that you might encounter in those compared to the t traditional manufacturing environment? Uh, so I, I think you probably want to break automation down to a couple of layers. Uh, so first layer is uh, structured environments. Structured environments are traditional manufacturing so where you have machines that goes into waypoint XYZ uh, and it doesn't necessarily know exactly what it's doing but it, it, it has to be extremely precise and it actually moves really, really fast as they can output hundreds of cars on a daily basis. Uh, the second piece uh, is semi-structure. Semi-structure where it's in an environment typically where a human needs to somewhat says, this could, these could be soft body manipulation, these could be uh, uh, manipulation that requires high amount of variables like pick and place in the warehouse and so forth. Those are not something that you could program uh, and it cannot follow the predefined trajectory, but rather it needs to make determinations on how to grab, where to place, uh, and, and, and how you manage the inputs and outputs. And then going from semi-structured to unstructured environment, this is like where you are thinking about how you potentially augment human capacity with robots that can actually do end-to-end -end tasks, such as, again, a laundry scenario, it knows how to put the laundry into the washer, transfer into a dryer, take it out, fold it, and put it on the shelf, right? And then the chaotic environment is something that's more applicable to homes. So the really, really exciting part about automation is that foundation models right now, so this simpler transformer architecture um, models now are able to start automating anywhere from semi-structured semi all the way to chaotic. Uh, and that's the part that's really, really exciting. That's, and, that, and those are the automation areas that we've been working on. I love that. And I mean, coming from the manufacturing world, right, and you said it right, uh, the automotive industry has been highly automated and in, in the industry institutionalized, industrialized for the last, I don't know, five decades almost. Uh, so we mainly operate in very structured environments. And as such, um, it's just a different scenario to bring a robot into, and most of it already uses robots. So when you come into environments that do not necessarily use robots right now, what are the biggest challenges that you, that you see in those environments, and how do you work with data, and what's more important, like data quantity, quality, can you like share some insights on that? Well, I think one of the biggest challenges to move into an environment where it has not been automated is actually retrofitting your robots into your existing environment in a way that it matches your existing workflow. Because typically in a manufacturing environment, your workflow has already been repurposed for a particular line of work. Uh, but uh, in areas where it hasn't, then it's matching your existing workflow. And that, this is where semi-humanoid, humanoid robots can come in because they can actually work like a human being, so they complement your existing workflows. Now, with regards to on the research side, which is like what what is missing from the research, uh, end to end models has a lot of very promise. It can use ChatGPT, language model, vision language models. It can do wonders. But the problem in embodied AI is that there's a general lack of data in the physical space today, right? Uh, so, and on top of the, the general lack of data, the end to end models does not perform at human level yet. 
So a lot of the research that we have been doing is how do we systematically drive up the quality of execution, the throughput of execution, the robustness of execution, such that it could minimize the amount of human interventions, and we've been actually quite successful at that. I love that. Um, double tapping on that. So when you have a structured environment, it's fairly easy to, to get training data. Well, no, not always easy, but at least you know exactly what kind of data you would need to train for high accuracy over time. Um, that is not necessarily the case if you are in a chaotic or unstructured environment. So how do you solve the data problem? Do you think like you know synthetic data might be of helpful might be of help for you? Or generally, where do you source your data and how do you embody data into your solution? Uh, so when you when we think about like general purpose robots or or, or developing you know language models, vision language models, you the, the one of the most important thing you have to think about is is not just data quantity. A lot of people think about it, you know, data scale. If I scale more data, then it's better. It's not necessarily so. It's actually scaling the right quality of data. And and that presents one of the most challenging uh, pieces for uh, our robotics training today. And this is where we focus a lot of our time to really focus on augmenting data through oral models, through simulations, and so forth, to really match and, uh, and actually create uh, additional scenarios for out of distribution data that we need to collect. Uh, so, uh, so to your point, I think real world data, real world data is the highest quality of, uh, quality of data, uh, data in procurement. And then it really comes down to, you know, potentially like world models and then simulations. Simulations obviously is potentially promising in terms of creating the quantity of data, but then those yield the highest quality, the quality of data in that it's not, there's a lot of simulation to real world environment gap, right? Even in the self-driving scenario where you see that, you know, the car is contacting with the road, it doesn't change the road as it drives through the road. It already still creates a lot of gaps. That's why you haven't seen simulation data even working too well. I mean, it works a little bit for the self-driving environment, but even for, but now for manipulation, you're actually interacting with the physical world, you're changing the state of the object as you're grabbing it, right? And, and, and that requires an even, it presents an even more challenging environment for uh, manipulation to learn from simulation. So this is an area of active research, but in the meantime, scaling out real world data is the most tangible piece uh, uh, to solve that puzzle. Yeah, I love that. And, and I mean, also for context, I think the, the consequences of, let's say, a robot or a self-driving car hallucinating uh, a lot more severe than, let's say, uh, ChatGPT misinterpreting the request and writing the wrong email. Um, how do you handle those catastrophic scenarios, knowing that you need the highest level of accuracy and safeguards in place? Um, and in that conjunction, what roles do LLMs and the current AI architecture actually play in your solution? And what I mean by that is, uh, most of them were trained right on, on words, uh, internet data, structured data, visual data, but usually what's missing is dexterity, tactile, feed, tactile feedback, like sensors that, are, that you're using in robots. So how do you add that layer to existing AI technology? Uh, so I think the, from a first principles perspective is that you know humans only have two eyes and we're able to interact very well with the physical environment around us. Uh, robots typically are uh, have a slightly different modality and it's actually very difficult to say that, hey, the future of humanoid is going to emulate humans exactly. Right? If we actually think about the history of technology automation advancement, uh, you know. Airplanes are supposed to emulate birds, but then airplanes look, looks or does not work anything like a bird. Similar to cars are supposed to replace horses, but it doesn't look anything like that either. Uh, so, uh, I mean, the, the broad strokes answer is uh, the general sensor modality modalities that is that we think beam is necessary, such as tactile, such as uh, visual, such as force feedback, and so forth, are generally very, very promising. But the mo most important thing is still it requires additional experimentation before we could really finalize on the sensor modalities that is really ultimately going to become the future state of, 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 of robotics. Uh, so what you're saying, if I, if I come from the automotive side, Tesla always was a big advocate of just using cameras as, as basically the ultimate layer of truth versus all the other manufacturers, and I come from Germany, so the German car manufacturers always believed in sensor redundancy, right? So they added like radar sensors, lighter sensors, and basically try to get the same data input through five different forms. So if one falls through, they still have another one to fall back on. Uh, so right now you're saying visual is probably the leading indicator and then we layer on top of that as we move forward? 
Yeah, I think the difference between cars and humans is that in cars, we use two eyes to drive, and that's it. But in, in actions, uh, is we need eyes, and we also need tactile feedback as well at the same time. So these are the two fundamental layers uh, as we think about solving the like, semi-structure, unstructured environments where it potentially replace human tasks. So looking at the current technology stack, holistically, right, not only the, the, the model layer or the AI layer, what's what's the biggest roadblock right now, or what would be the biggest unlock, with, let's say, chat GPT moment for robotics moving forward? Uh, I think, uh, going back to this, so I think about the general purpose robots in two dimensions uh, to focus on. Uh, one dimension is uh, generalization. Generalization really want, uh, could break down into environment generalization, object generalization, and task generalization. Uh, really uh, putting, being able to place a robot in any new environments, it can handle any new objects, and it could do any types of tasks with the language command or some sort of prompt is one, in one, one area of generalization we need to tackle. The second piece is performance, which is the robot needs to work at human level throughput, human level throughput, human level quality, and human level robustness. Uh, and, and if it's missing any one of these uh, three uh, uh, traits, it's not able to deliver tangible ROIs for people in the industry as well. So in these two areas, I mean, it both presents its own challenge, challenges in that. From a generalization indexes, uh, we need to drastically scale up the amount of data uh, that we need. So this is through you know learning through human videos, learning through uh, imitation learning, uh, that's one area, but in diverse amount of environments. And the second piece is how do we collect the highest quality of data such that it's able to perform at human level uh, performance, and that's gonna be the second piece. And then piecing all of this together for a massive amount of pre-training that could completely understand this, uh, the 3D, 3D world and 3D space around, around us is, is also another really big challenge. But I'll say that, you know, like, the industry has really make, been making really strong um, progress. I, you know, I when I decided to start this company, I, I kind of gave a conservative estimate that it will probably take us about two to three years before we ship production. But now, you know, it's like six to nine months into the company, we have already shipped production, and the foundation models are already working in production for some of our existing customers. And I find that to be really promising and fascinating, and that's and that and that kind of momentum will only accelerate in the next few years. Uh, super exciting. And uh, one one last point about the current state of the art. How do you, like, we've all seen those videos where, where humanoids move rather goofy and slow, right? And it takes them a lot longer to perform a task than a human would. Um, what's, what's the current state of the art when it comes to like inference and actually being able to process all of that on the edge and like enable reasoning and situational awareness and decisions? Uh, do you see any roadblocks for that? Uh, or how do you solve it right now? So I think in terms of, so I think we could, like in, in the context of what I talked about earlier, structure, semi-structure, you know, unstructured, chaotic, at, at every stage, uh, you want to unlock additional capabilities, right? In structured environments, you probably just need raw imitation learning uh, where the robot is able to perform the task in a stationary environment. In a uh, semi-structured environment, you need the robot to be able to move to a certain degree and able to reason, right? Like for example, like we're, we're uh, with one of our uh, hospitality clients where uh, we're folding their towels for them. Typically, imitation learning is I just fold the, the towels and now stack it. But then after you stack the towels for like, you know, you have a pile of 10 towels, but it's getting a little too tall, it's gonna start toppling over. The model needs to understand how to start a new stack, right? And, and, that, and that's the reasoning capability behind it, which has already been unlocked. And then the next step is like mobility, we get into mobility, we get into chain reasoning, uh, and objective reasoning, and, and those are the, the key. So, Justin, we've come to an end. Uh, let, me, let me just finish with one question uh, about a future algo. So everyone, I think, is aware of the big quote, I don't want AI to write my emails and be creative for us so that I have more time doing my laundry and cleaning my house. It should be the other way around. So in a robotic sense, um, what is the use case or the application area that you are most excited about where you know robots actually augment humanity and actually help us versus replacing us? I think it's actually mostly on the things that humans don't want to do. Uh, I think those are those tend to be the most mechanic, those tend to be the most repetitive, dull, dangerous. That's what the 3D is a dull, dull dangerous. dangerous and 
30, 30, 30 and dear, right? Like, so I, I think that's the most promising part of uh, the future of robotics, which is we're, we're going to create a, a world where it's, you know, gets to sit in a pod like, like those people on Wally -E and, uh, and, 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 and chill out and, uh, and, and, and be plugged into, uh, you know, a simulation world. Well, with that being said, thank you so much, and I hope you all get your wallet for today. All right. Thank you.